talking. Let's get it set. All right, we're, we're pretty close. Uh, so, uh, hello everyone, and thank you for attending uh, this evening's uh, presentation, Discovering Aesthetic in Architecture. I, I'm going to review some of the basic AIA things that we we'll just say when we start. Um, this is a recorded video. So, if you're attending the live one on August 27th, 2020, you will receive one AIA learning unit, but you need to stay on until the end and I'll let you know what you need to do. So if you're watching this otherwise, because we are going to post this to our EDI committee webpage and on our AIA Orange County YouTube, um, you so it's a little different. Um, please, everyone, um, keep yourself muted. Um, you know, I've got cats and dogs running around and you never know when they're gonna start up. So it just helps the presenter out if you could do so. And then again, as I mentioned, I will at the end of this um, include an email address where you would just email us, include your membership number so we know what it is. We'll record your units that way. Also, I will be monitoring the chat line. And so there will be times to chat you'll be allowed to go ahead and pull yourself off mute and do so. But if you want to put a, a question into the chat line, I'll read those off. So again, uh, tonight's um, uh, uh, presentation is discovering a black aesthetic in architecture and we have four learning objectives. I'm going to read those. Attendees will learn about diversity of architectural elements brought by different immigrant cultures. Attendees will learn about racial inequities in architecture and built environment and the causes. Attendees will learn about the impact of non-inclusive color-based laws in creation of communities. And attendees will learn about COVID-19's impact on academics and higher education. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Meghna to do some introductions. Hi, everyone. First of all, thank you so much for coming to the event. Um, it's already Thursday and probably 40 hours of Zoom already. So thank you for adding another hour of Zoom to your schedule. <laughs> um, with that, I want to introduce Demar. Um, Demar is an LA-based designer and he's a writer also. He's a founder and principal at Off Top Design. He's a curator and exhibitions associate at Architecture Plus Design Museum in LA. He recently graduated from Woodbury University, finishing his master's in architecture with a focus on urban design. He's a firm believer that architecture and good design should not only be for the privileged. This is something I personally connect with because I firmly believe that architecture is a right, not a privilege. And um, when it comes to Chennai initiatives, most of the AEC firms are limiting the conversation to hiring and retention. But living in a diverse community, if we don't educate ourselves about the history and the history and the evolution of architecture and race, we're not going to achieve the grand vision of creating equitable spaces. Hopefully this, will, um, this event will help everybody learn a little bit about architecture and race and uh, maybe it will pick your interest enough to go and you know, do some more research on your own and help all of us be better designers. With that, I'll hand it off to Demar uh, for his presentation on everything the Black Aesthetics. Uh, Demar will also share about the watch project that he's working on. And uh, he will also share how you can help him in this initiative or get involved. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Demar. Uh, so I have a presentation for you, and I'll get right to it. but. I also have a dog that might start barking at any time, so forgive me. Give me one second. So, my research really started um, at the end of my second year of graduate school, um, which is a three year program. And once I was getting to my final year, which, you know, you start to do thesis prep, uh, I was kind of realizing, you know, you start to think where you're going to work, what are you going to do, um, where, you know, where can you kind of have a voice in architecture? Um, and I just, I just realized that I was only being taught how to design for other communities and how to 
kind of design in in their aesthetics and not not anything in, in mine. I never saw any architecture that was in um, a black community through those two years of school. I never saw work from an African American architect uh, through those two years. And I, I really just wanted to kind of take control because I knew that I wanted my work to, to be in the communities that I grew up um, and that I'm a part of. So around this time, I, I just started to say, you know, what is black architecture? And I would ask students, I would ask uh, professors, I would ask, you know, friends, and no one really knew what it was. Some, some people would say something, but it was not really what I was looking for. Um, but I would ask, you know, do you have an image of it in your head? Uh, and they would say no. And then I would ask, well, what about black neighborhoods? Is there an image in your head? Um, and, and there was, and it was, you know, I would kind of dig deeper and I would ask, what is it, what's the image and why? You know, it's always sort of this negative stereotype or this, this negative perception around black neighborhoods. And I started to wonder why, and I just wanted to dig deeper into, you know, why that is and how, how that perception happened. Um, so I started really looking at the history of housing for African Americans starting in, you know, starting once they actually Africans once uh, were brought to America. And so from that point up until 1968, it was still legal to discriminate uh, based on race and in, uh, in terms of housing. So 1968 is when it finally was outlawed. And you think everyone who's coming to, to America comes and gets to bring this sort of architectural heritage with them, that kind of uh, puts a stamp on the built environment for them. And, and that's not really true for, for Black Americans. So I'll start here with uh, this uh, newspaper image from 68. And so specifically, I started to look into Black LA, which you know is South Central. And so this is the densest population of Black people west of the Mississippi. And you look at these blue dots, this is the Black population. And outside of South Central, you don't see any more blue dots. So when this sort of gentrification or displacement happens in South Central, you're going at least 60 miles either east to the Inland Empire, like Marino Valley, where I grew up, um, or you're going uh, at least 60 miles or 50 miles north up to kind of the Palmdale, Lancaster area. And Watts specifically, which is where my site is located, 1990, it was over 80% black, it was close to 90% black. And today it's under 27% black. So you have this displacement happen again and you wonder where, what happens to the history? Uh, what happens to sort of this lineage of South Central that is, you know, has been here for over 70 years and kind of established a, a stronghold for, for black Americans in this space that wasn't, you know, this is the only space they were allowed to go. And so you finally get some identity through the space and, and now you're kind of being kicked out of that. So that was also a big point of emphasis on, on my research is how to be able to have a cultural imprint on the built environment. So when you look at, this is again going into the first kind of forms of housing, which are the slave houses. And this is what's today. And this is one of the five housing projects that Watts has um, in a city of less than 12,000. So you see these bars here. These bars are, look at the direction of them. What it, along with the building, you, you see the bars on the windows and the bars on, on the doors. And this, this looks just like a prison in it. And the way these bars face make it seem like, this is the, the built environment kind of making it seem like you're supposed to be trapped in it. And that's not what, what your housing should do or what your neighborhood should do. What does that do to, to someone's mental? We know of the disproportionate rates of African-Americans in jail. Does the built environment add to that? It's like, what's architecture's role in that? Because architecture does have a role. Um, 
And so I'm going to read this quick excerpt from a book that was really important to my research called Spatializing Blackness. And so uh, it goes, the children here are surrounded by wire mesh and fencing that makes their living environment resemble the catwalks of a prison. The abundance of security measures in these black neighborhoods and housing projects specifically, such as policing, 24 seven video surveillance, perimeter patrols, apartment sweeps, curfews, stop and frisk techniques, the appearance makes it seem as if they're not supposed to escape, that the built environment is doing that. So I, you know, once I kind of got this uh, side in Watts, I started to analyze Watts specifically. And, and this was probably eight months of just, and you know, this is continuous, but um, the common materials that I found in Watts, and it would be bars, again, like you saw in that first image, on the doors and the windows, there are police everywhere. Um, there are a lot of, there's a lot of graffiti, there's a lot of cameras, especially in the projects, there are cameras literally everywhere. They, you know, you can't, this one, you, you can't cruise past a spot more than two or three times within 12 hours or four hours, of, you know, or you get arrested. What if you're just looking for something? You know, like that's not inviting. Um, so all these sort of things, are of the built environment. So I'm, I wanted to see, what, again, going back to that perception question, how does, how does the built environment add to the negative perception of Black people? There, we know that there's a, a negative perception issue with Black Americans for, for some reason. Um, and does putting them in an area that resembles a prison, what does that do? You know, I, I mean, if you have all these police in this area that, that resembles it, that it resembles a jail and the way that the police uh, surveil the area and the way that the, the buildings look and, and the streets and the trains and the, the, over, and the freeway overpasses are, are set up to box you in. Um, I just really am interested in and changing that. And so you look at images like this, this is architecture. This is, this is, this is the architecture that's, that's the background of this, this man holding his baby, which, it, which is a beautiful image of a man holding his baby. But his background doesn't, it doesn't do him justice. Or this image to the right, it, it doesn't do the person justice. We know what, what a background does to someone's perception of the person in front of it. So Watts has a, an acronym that they go by called We Are Taught to Survive. And I've known this all my life. You know, I have family in, in Compton and really close ties to Watts and et cetera. But um, when I started to reanalyze this as an adult, to be taught to survive and not to be taught to thrive is, is pretty heartbreaking. Um, and that, that says a lot to me, you know. Um, so here we're going to get into my site. My site is directly next to the Watts Towers. And we have about a quarter acre, um, yeah, a little over a quarter acre. And um, so y'all yeah, kind of, there's already two structures on the, on the uh, lot. There's a shotgun house that, um, hasn't been used in a while. It was it was used as an art residence about 10 years ago for a few years. And that since has died down, but we're trying to resurrect that. Um, and then this is just a uh, small garage that's uh, been on the property as well. And this triangle right here next to this red triangle is the, the Watts Tower. So as soon as you're off the site, you're onto, uh, as soon as you're off the tower site, you're onto my site. And so I started to try and look at how to make the architecture add to, um, to someone's image and add to their perception. And how, how, does, how does architecture, I mean, at the same time, I wanted to derive from Black culture for, for Black people to really be able to look at the building and see themselves and then be able to feel a sense of pride as, um, I guess for uh, an example, my girlfriend was born in Guanajuato, Mexico, 
and we were driving down the freeway one day and she saw these buildings and she said that they reminded her of home and she was so excited you know and I, I'm thinking I don't even get it because I, th I thought they were kind of basic looking buildings and you know they were nice the colors were nice and everything but I didn't know you know why she was so excited and she was like oh it makes me feel like I'm home like I just and she was just so proud you know and I've never I've never been proud of necessarily the, the built environment in my neighborhood, I, there's not anything that I identify with that's positive. I identify with those materials that I showed you, surveillance uh, with abandoned buildings, with graffiti, with uh, bars on windows and doors. That's kind of when I know that I'm in a black neighborhood and that I'm in like, I mean, on one hand, I'm happy to be in a black neighborhood because I feel a little more comfortable, but I also know these are the negative signals that tell me I'm here. So to be able to start to craft a, a Black aesthetic and an architectural language that will come purely from, um, from Black aesthetics, from Black culture, and, which includes uh, art, music, dance, hair, et cetera, I started to take these descriptive words that I would get from uh, either Black artists uh, or architects or writers or um, musicians, uh, et cetera, that, that would describe black people or black culture. And I would just take that word and put it down. And then I would find an architecture by either a, a black or African architect. And I would kind of uh, put that building there to kind of give me a, a precedent or something. And that was my taxonomy of black architectural characteristics that I was looking for. And then I moved it into a taxonomy of uh, Black art aesthetics and techniques. That introduced me to Kahim Wiley, to Titus Kaffar, to Afrofuturism, to um, Ernie Barnes, just a, a lot of amazing Black artists. And there were specific things about their art that I thought um, matched the, the descriptive uh, word and kind of took off of that. And these are the nine pieces of text that kind of influenced the, uh, the work uh, the most. And so I took three descriptive words from this thing. This is only one of, this house is kind of one of nine uh, case studies that I'm hoping to do. And so for this specific house, I chose these three characteristics that I wanted to try and, and speak to through the architecture. So, and I'll speak on one hand to this image here. Uh, I think that this picture is extremely black. And I say that because this, this dance, the way that, how fluid it is and how their bodies move, how the artists made them kind of elastic. I don't see any other, I can't see any other culture who would have a painting of their dance styles like this. You know, I think that this just spoke to me in terms of posture and body language and how it's very specific um, by culture and how black people's posture and body language is so, is so specific. Um, the other thing is this, this image here by uh, Kaheen Wiley really uh, reinforced that idea of how much a background speaks to the perception of the subject. And this, this man right here, He's in something that I would wear every day, boots and a sweatsuit. But you can be perceived, and he would often be perceived as a thug or something, just for that outfit, through no fault of his own. That's just the fashion culture. But with this background, you look at him as somewhat royal. And, and it's, I just thought that was so beautiful to take someone in there in their image and make their the background speak to that image in a positive light. And that's what I really wanted the architecture to try to do again. Um, so you'll kind of see that come, come a little later in the, in the uh, project. Here, this is just some African housing precedents I was interested in. Uh, specifically, it's called the House of Architecture. This is uh, located in Northern Nigeria. And I really like this sort of handwork. All these things that 
oftentimes the men would do the uh, building or the structural work and the women would do all the design work and they would do it by hand. And I, I just thought that it was so beautiful to, to have a community build these structures and they speak like they speak volumes to their aesthetics and their, their principles and values. So here, this is actually a video, but I'm not going to play it right now. But what it is, is uh, dances. And he, this guy goes into these 30 dances over the last 10 or 15 years that um, have been created through Black culture. And it's so specific, you know, things called, I know some of you may not know any of these names, but Millie Rock and Chicken Noodle Soup and uh, Electric Slide, all, all these dances. And there's, so, I mean, a lot of your kids and family members are doing these dances on TikTok and it's inspired from black culture. And I thought that that needs to also be in this language. So I started with columns and I know that this, you know, these Roman and Greek Doric columns come from the posture or body language of the Roman man, and Greek man. And I just show kind of how the posture and the body language of a black person is completely different. Um, we don't sit the same or walk the same or, or stand the same or dance the same. So I wanted to try and uh, start speaking through, uh, start speaking to that. Here, this is um, getting into uh, hair techniques. Another thing that's extremely specific to cultures um, in black culture, box braids is one of the most um, I mean, my mom, my sister, my niece, they all have box braids or have had them at some point. And my niece is 11 <clears throat> or 12, I'm sorry, and she's been doing her own box braids since she was like seven. And this is just a thing that you can pick up somehow. And it's so meticulous and it's so, it's, it's, it's geometry through there. They're, they're really kind of these beautiful tessellations. So I wanted to um, translate that. And for the hair of, uh, men it's waves and that's another you know thing that has to do again with um, your hands and you know you brush your hair you put a do-rag on it it's, it's something that you're always kind of doing and I noticed that that was a link between African culture and African American culture is sort of this hand um, doing things by hand and so I turned that into an architectural skin kind of combining these tessellations and these patterns um, and this also kind of allowed me to give a, a link back to Africa, who are more known for patterns and kind of at, more than Black Americans are. Um, but I, I wanted to speak to that link, even though we're unaware. There are a lot of Black Americans who don't identify with Africans, but I wanted to, to try and link this building to kind of speak to, to both cultures, uh, more so to Black American cultures. So I'm sure. So here you get into the house, and what I was trying to do is create frames, really. Um, frames for backgrounds, we're still speaking to perception. Um, so here you see uh, these frames that are going to be going into the porch area, and then another frame that will be going along the side of this house where the architectural skin is, along our, as well as this front area. Um, and secondly, the light, you see these kind of yellow filled in areas are where the windows are for um, these two sides of the house. And I wanted to try and speak as much to uh, photography. And again, we're still on procession, you're gonna get tired of me saying it. Um, but the way that you photograph black skin is different. And the way, you know, light has to hit our skin differently. And I wanted to speak to kind of some sort of dynamic light in the house to be able to have, um, uh, just a different a different experience than just a rectangle window um, like those project homes that you saw. So here's just going through the framing. And I just want you guys to just take note of this. Uh, this is on the porch right here, this graphic, and I'll speak more to it um, in a few slides. So here is what I called my, my elevation image. Um, I, I didn't want, 
I felt like if I was looking forward or looking towards unearthing a black aesthetic, but I wanted my images to, to be different as well. I didn't want a standard, you know, uh, architecture elevation. And so this image specifically speaks to Watts. Um, you see the towers behind it and it's the piece that kind of brings, that's the only tourist attraction that walks. And it's done so much for the community. Um, but I always think every time I go to the site, I think, man, people come here and they look and then they, they look at the towers and then they leave. They don't go down the block. They don't visit a restaurant. They just come and look at this thing that in this black neighborhood, this historical black neighborhood, but they don't appreciate black culture there. They come to appreciate the towers, not for the black artists who have, have made or have continued to make that a staple in the community. Um, just for the work of Simon Rodea, which again, I, I respect. Um, this is this is kind of posed on top of this liquor store, which you'll find everywhere in Watts. And you see you know, the surveillance and uh, cameras, as well as these people pointing to this house and pointing to this man in front of this house. And what this really speaks to is an experience that I had at, at Destination Crenshaw, which is a, uh, an opening of an outdoor um, museum that is kind of trying to um, appreciate Black culture in the, in the South Central Crenshaw District. And I was photographing, and there's these people dancing in the middle of the street because it's somewhat of an outdoor concert. And I'm looking, and you know, Black and Brown are all in the middle dancing in the street. And, there's these white families that are kind of on the, along the curb. So I walked over there and there's probably eight or so different families and they're kind of dancing a little bit, but they never got off the curb. And I wonder why, you know, so I walked, I went to school the next day and I, I was asking a, a classmate of mine who was a white, uh, white man. And he said, oh yeah, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have gone in either. And I said, why? He said, because that's not my space, that's your space or that's their space. And I said, do you realize that every day I come to school or we go to the mall or we go to a, a restaurant or a nice area that we're in your space? This, this architecture is about hosting, you know, being able to host in your space, in your black neighborhood and have people come, have commerce be able to take place and, and to be able to pay homage to Black culture when you go into a Black neighborhood. So this, you kind of can make out the uh, form of this house as a crown, and um, I was really inspired by Basquiat, and this kind of, as well as um, all these masks that I would see through Africa, and, or sorry, not masks, crowns, and I wanted to, um, as much as I was talking about perception that happened in this whole project, I just thought it was fitting that that this first um, house could could have this form or could take this form. And then nice getting into the sections and kind of speaking to um, the light qualities again. These are two perspectives of the front porch. And then now this part we're going to kind of get into, and this is the last part of the presentation, just about two more slides. Um, this speaks to more the community aspect of what Black architecture, what I want this Black architecture to represent. And so I needed, I, I wanted the, the house to be able to, or the property to be able to give as many resources to the community as possible. So this map right here is showing the one grocery store that's in Watts, which is a food for less, which is a, a not great grocery store. You know, the produce is often old. Um, where do, where are they supposed to get produce? You know, um, the liquor stores don't have fresh produce. So this is kind of just showing how long somebody has to walk uh, to get there. And so we have a fence line that's almost 300 feet. So along this fence line, I wanted to, uh, try to get the resources. So we have about 
15 different fruits and vegetables um, and spices growing right now. And we're growing about another 15 or 20. Um, and we're going to give these out for free along this art walk that's going to happen along this fence line. So along with the free fruits and vegetables that they're able to take, we also kind of uh, got, uh, I'm sorry, additional programming, I guess, where we can um, teach the community how to grow their own organic fruits and vegetables and how to hopefully continue this idea of, of growing along their fence line and, and some for themselves, some for the community on, on, you know, on the other side. Um, but besides the free uh, produce, we have an outdoor library that we've already started collecting uh, books for. Um, and the last section is two sections of framing. One in particular is for uh, the community to be able to, and hopefully it's kids who really take us up on this, um, who can sketch and exhibit and, and drop their own frames into uh, these sort of slots that we have along the wall. And the second section of framing is for um, quarterly exhibits that the artist in residence, which is what that AEU will serve as, um, will perform in it. Uh, and exhibit along this fence line here um, every three months. So here you have, this is the last image, and this is kind of a shot of this outdoor library, and um, this is an earlier sketch of our um, fence line. So this is quite, this has changed quite a bit ever since. Um, we now have a nonprofit who has taken over in, in terms of the installation at Dreamhouse, and they kind of, they took, they took uh, charge of their the aesthetics of this uh, this art walk now, and this is kind of the last. I think this is the last. And yeah, um, that is my presentation. I'm sorry I didn't stop for questions. I kind of just start rolling, but definitely feel free to ask me some questions now. Tomorrow we don't have anything in the chat line. So if anybody wants to just ask a question, just feel free to go ahead and unmute yourself. Hey, Damar, this is Brian Dougherty, and I've got a question. You said you grew up in Moreno Valley and um, I was wondering how you feel that your growing up there may have shaped your response to the environment in Watts and some of the other areas, because obviously there are differences between those two different, if nothing else, in terms of the age of the buildings and the ideas about what the community ought to be. Yeah, I think um, that it had a large, it had a large impact on it. I think that the built environment, in terms of where I lived, um, I kind of bounced around. So I lived in environments in Reno Valley that was exactly like Watts, um, you know, where I had, you know, I had my first friend get killed um, by a gunshot when I was 11. And this is, it's not just the built environment, it turns into the social environment as well. And so I think that these things kind of, it impacts you. Um, and I mean, um, in terms of LA and them be kind of being different, uh, there's definitely differences, but everyone I grew up with is from LA. Uh, my family, again, I, I have roots here. I'm at Thanksgiving dinners over here. Um, but it, I think just to, to grow up in a, a black neighborhood and understand how the built environment can can affect your mental it was kind of the biggest impactor or i guess the biggest um, influence on on my research probably mar this is diane mclean i have a um a question but first i just want to say i'm just really excited about this project i really love it so um i it just I just really feel good that, that you've done it. And I wanted to know, um, 
but what's next? Are you, do you feel like inspired to keep going along this pathway and have this be, you know, grow into more of a, a movement of how, you know, it's like bringing this awareness and then developing more sites and. Yes, definitely. I think that um, I've always considered this a case study and I, I, I kind of have the number nine in my head, but I want to go to, I want to kind of do these houses and different and maybe they won't just be houses maybe a turn you know the scale changes as we progress but um where the community is you know blackness is kind of the spectrum where black communities in la is completely different than black community in philly there there are similarities but there are a lot of cultural differences still and i only say philadelphia because that's the second project that i'm working on now um with a um started probably about three months on concept and design um, but the one in Watts is kind of still the focus because we're uh, looking for sponsors and donors still and kind of partners in it but I definitely see this continuing and hoping to kind of be able to um, take this idea and get, scale it up and down um, yeah. for different projects. Well I guess that was my next question about the sponsors and donors because I think that your your story of what you like the the background of the culture and looking into what is it that that there's a that, that where we can as a culture lift our identity and you know have there be a positive impact for next generations growing up and um, and start to express that and expand it and have the the built environment be reflective of that is just so powerful and I think that there are a lot of people who could um, buy into that as you know building a movement on on that um, background that you've set up for the behind the scenes of your thought process in doing this project i hope so and i, I mean i've definitely had students who have reached out um, and even architects who are already way more established than me and say that they're interested in continuing this in their own work and that's what is kind of the I definitely don't think that I'm gonna drop a house and say, okay, that's black architecture. You know, I think that it's sort of, here's my version. Everybody kind of can can speak um, through their building, you know, and we can kind of have this dialogue through that. So I hope that, I, I, I fully believe that it'll be students who are looking for a different path and are looking to, to allow their, their culture to shine through their design. So hopefully this continues way yeah. more than this. And because we have like different cultures and then, you know, at some point, you know, there, we need to have that idea of allowing people to cross those boundaries and, you know, connect better. And so I think there's a story in all of that as well. I agree. I agree. Step by step, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, thank you for sharing. Thank you. Damar, you do have some uh, very thoughtful comments in the chat line. One, uh, Magna posted your fundraiser. Uh, oh, thank you. We'd like you to, to speak a little bit about. Christine uh, mentioned that uh, she loves your thoughtful regard to the psychological effects of the architecture. And then Rita posted a question. It will be wonderful to introduce this topic into academic curriculum. Have you considered discussions with the local architectural programs to encourage them to cover these issues and topics? I actually prepared a syllabus with my thesis that I've just kind of been updating ever since and I send out every so often um, to different schools. But yes, I definitely have been trying to um, get this into academia. Um, if it's not me teaching it, it's okay too. I just want, you know, I just want it there. So, but no, I, I haven't had um, any real conversations about it yet with anyone so far. So how did you get interested or even aware of the field of architecture? Was there a, an influence in your life? Was it a book you read or a movie or a, a teacher you had? How did you even become aware of the field? I'm just curious. So um, I didn't know anyone in architecture until I got to architecture school. <laughs> um, 
Okay. I, I wasn't that aware of the field, but again, growing up in Reno Valley, you know, we're 50 miles out of LA. But once I started driving, I would just be in LA every weekend. And I didn't know why that attracted me. A lot of times I didn't get out. I would just look at the buildings and I did that often through my undergrad as well. I was always kind of driving to an area where I could just look at buildings. And, you know, I was always kind of into creative things, but I didn't know what I could do to kind of really make money. And I think these are sort of first generation college student problems. Um, you just go, you know, go with the, everybody says a doctor is going to make money. And that's what my undergrad was in is, is bio. Um, really after three years working, um, in health, in the healthcare, I just kind of knew that it wasn't me and, and was doing a bunch of research and seeing what I specifically was interested in possibly doing forever. And I was always billed, but I just, I never really put it together. And I finally did randomly a, a year before I got into Woodbury. Wow, thank you. <clears throat> we do have a couple more comments. Uh, uh, Rita is more than happy to introduce you to some professors at Cal Poly Pomona if you don't already have connections. And you can get a hold of Rita through Magna, so she can help with that introduction, or you can reach out to me as well. Uh, and then we have one from Jay, a question. Uh, can you expand on a different kind of light needed in Black environments? Um, a different kind of light? Yes. And so it was specifically um, relating to photography. Um, and it was a different kind of light needed to be able to photograph black skin properly. Um, I would see photos all the time before when I had like uh, amateur photography friends or something who would post these images. And I'm looking like, that's not, you know, it's not good. And if you don't get the right, uh, the light right on black skin, then the image is horrible. And it's, it's a lot harder to photograph black skin because you know you need your light to be particular. And I just wanted to speak to, I, I hope that that's what you were speaking about when I, when I spoke to uh, the light about how it travels into the building. That's more so what I was, what I was speaking about. Mara, I just wanted to comment how impressive you are and you must be, you know, hopefully you have an opportunity to speak to others that are thinking about traveling down the path of architecture or design because um, I think, like you said, you know, sometimes you don't know whether people that are like you that are looking to get into that. So um, hopefully you're trying to connect with people with that because it's, you're, you're just awesome. And um, secondarily, I wanted to say like, it was really eye-opening from the very beginning. I think, I can't believe sometimes that these people don't connect the dots to the things like it seems so obvious like when you saw the first images of some of those the how you know the housing and the way they look with the design with the bars on it and then the you know it did look like a prison and and people become often product of your environment of how you feel and your perception from the outside inside right um kind of crazy i mean even we go into healthcare you know design right and and the big thing in healthcare and assisted living is to not make it look like it's a place that you go to die, right? Um, so that whole thought process of like, let's do that differently because we want people to be inspired to live, not to die, right? And how do they recover? So we change the colors and this and that and the other. Well, isn't that the same thing? So it was sort of an aha moment for me and I appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Learn. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for everything. That's just, uh, I hope I, I don't know if I covered all, but I hope um, it, it, it's tough because um, I got so, I was so fortunate to be able to find the homeowner that I did. And I met her the first day of, um, really the first week of my thesis. I was speaking about the idea to any professor who would listen to me. And she, he introduced me to the homeowner named Miss Janine. And she had this idea of community symmetry with that project when I was specifically looking at black architecture, you know, just in the architecture lens. And, and when she was bringing that to me, I just, I just thought that, you know, black architecture and community symmetry 
should probably go hand in hand and it just opened the project up so much. Um, but really in terms of, you know, the black environment now, or black neighborhoods, it's gonna be a, a really tough battle because we know that the developers are getting this land and they're not, majority of these developers do not care about a black aesthetic. They're gonna try and do their thing and get their money and the built environment is gonna kind of suffer. So I think that the only way to kind of go at this is on a small scale for now, but. I'd like to build upon, uh, this is Betsy Doggerty uh, talking, uh, Jim Wyrick's uh, question, Jim, which I think was right on because we are, if we look at the profile of, of architecture in general, we do not have a diverse population. I'm sorry, I mean, you know, there are more women. How do we effectively, and I think we have to reach down into elementary schools. Same, I agree. Schools and have mentorships and, and, and internship programs. And I'll tell you, I've been picking up the phone and calling schools and I get great responses, but the ultimate response is, I'm sorry, we don't have any black students at this school. And how do we even get architecture on the radar so that these young children, first of all, are thinking about their environment and they're interested in making a difference which would attract them to architecture rather than thinking they're gonna go work for Google and make tons of money or something, you know, if, they're, if they have a creative side to them. Do you have any perspective on that about what an effective strategy might be? I, I actually agree with you that it needs to start at elementary school because, you know, that's when everybody, that's when kids are at the height of their sort of creativity and just interested in anything. And, um, you know, just like you just said that a lot of the schools that you're contacting say they don't have black children. That's what the colleges are saying when they're trying to do their recruiting for the year. I, I went to Woodbury and I would speak with people and they say, okay, this is kind of the line where our recruitment stops. And it was never hitting South Central, but that's where all the black kids are. So we kind of have to take it to them at this point. You know, it's gonna, we're gonna have to, to be willing to, to drive really, or to, you know, to go the extra mile because the kids need it and nobody's coming to them. Yeah. LAUSD high schools do have a program uh, and they came to us because we do work there asking us if we'd be willing to hire an intern. This kid lived in South Central. He was 16. His mother drove him to Orange County twice a week and waited for him while he spent two to four hours in our office. Great kid, did apply for a graduate, uh, for, for a four year uh, college. It wasn't in architecture, but I got to write him a letter of recommendation. And to watch him grow and how, and what a commitment the family and the child made, but it's just hard. It's, it's hard, you know, to make it happen. It's expensive once he's gonna get to, uh... To, if he did go into architecture, yeah. you know, that, that's, you kind of need support all the way through because architecture is such an expensive field. College is expensive, period, you know. Yeah, exactly. I'll tell you, the cost of education, we have some, prop, that, that's a whole nother conversation. Yeah. <laughs> hey, hey, Betsy. Well, this is Brian Doggerty again. I sort of a sharing and a question at the same time. I recently watched, I think it was on Apple Plus, a series called Home. And there was one segment that was about, I wish I could remember the gentleman's name, but an architect on the south side of Chicago who I think made a presentation at the AI convention that I went to recently um, about his acting as both developer, purchasing, I think he purchased the- The Aster Gates that, or Lee Bay. That, the first name that you- The Aster. Amazing, and so you're obviously familiar with him. I, I just, I found what he was doing in so many ways so inspirational because it's a lot of the same sort of goals that you're going for, but at the same time, he was able to assemble a group of investors and other people to start buying up the neighborhood, basically. Um, so I, I think, you know, to, take that same sort of idea in Watts, um, no reason why that can't work. 
I agree. And, you know, when I first was introduced to Theaster, I mean, not that I've met him personally, but introduced to his work, I was interested in it. And, uh, you know, I guess the difference is to be able to, you know, he's an artist. So for an artist to be able to create a piece that he's going to auction for 250000 and that funds his whole project. So it gives him, That's you know, true. and that I, also adds into I, I forgot, you're right. I forgot he was an artist and not an architect. You're right. So it just, it oh, makes it, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm sure I, could, I, I definitely would be interested in, in taking the, the other side of his business. Demar, uh, this is Suyama. I have uh, just a question. I have, have you looked at the public space in, in African-American communities and the lack thereof? Like say, for example, where you grew up. And if you look at all these, you know, places where, you know, the people of African-American background and where they grew up and what kind of resources they have I mean, your presentation was extremely powerful and um, thank you for doing it. It took a lot of courage, I'm sure. And like, you know, from the chief's huts and to, you know, girls' hairdos, where fractals and things like that has been Im implemented and there are stories in all of that. I mean, that's all very rich and very pure. But the, I feel like, you know, uh, creative thinking and trying to think ourselves out of a box kind of thing happens when we are very close to nature or we have some place for release in this current day and age where the density is driving everything and the, you know, developers are driving everything. Have you looked at any research on you know, the lack of uh, public spaces and how much that has effect to African-American communities and to bring out black architecture? And you know, if you look at it in that, have you looked at that kind of thing? I'm just interested. Yeah, um, mostly in terms of, I mean, I kind of started looking at green space. And when I looked at public space, I kind of got taken off course because as there's, it's common that there's a lack of safe public space um, in Black neighborhoods, whether that's through um, areas that someone might feel unsafe because there's a bunch of cops, or there may be gangs, or there may, you know, whatever, whatever the, the reason. Um, that I kind of, I, my interest kind of shifted because I found how Black people use space in a really efficient way. And I would look at certain activities that, that I would do when I was in high school or something. In high school, we would shoot dice, right? And we would, we would shoot dice in corners in these little random spots that nobody would ever look at or function in. But we just took it and and made it this this thing, you know, and and the how I guess how B boxing started, where you just grab a, a cardboard box and slap it down, and you dance, and now that's the spot. So I I quickly kind of got more interested in that, but in terms of um, in terms of the public space, I definitely wanted to speak to it in the Watts project, and that's the big idea behind this art walk in. Um, we're just finishing up the, the newer designs, but this, it kind of turned into this more kind of enclosed space. Um, since it's next to the towers, the Watts Towers had all these black artists who have really established black aesthetics and, and art, like Noah Purifoy, John Otteridge. The, they taught outside of the Watts Towers in this public space where everybody could see it. And since we're right there, I kind of wanted to speak to that and reactivate the public space of Watts Towers using interior or fine art, but placing it on, in public space and putting putting an outdoor library, putting benches where you could sit in a shaded area, in a comfortable area, adding, adding reason not only for the Black community to be able to come to this area and either sell you know, all types of things that Black people will sell in Watts. You got people selling t-shirts or incense or or tamale carts, or you know, everybody you can kind of pull up to a spot and it activates through just, you know, kind of, I mean, through possibly the art walk or, or at least the art walk is hoping to, to add to that activation. But yeah, I was definitely interested in, in how to um, use public space in, in this project. Emma, can you share a little bit about your fundraiser? Yeah, sure. Um, so this, the fundraiser is 
kind of attacking the funding in three different ways um, through grants, through um, partnerships and sponsorships with firms, and through the fundraiser. And this is to be able to pay, uh, of course, for all the construction, but also for our team of collaborators. Um, after the thesis, we got to kind of gather. I, I always saw my design studio off top being something that was this intersection of, of architecture and art and design. And um, so as our collaborators, what you'll see on that GoFundMe, we have Dream How two artists out of South Central who graduate to Otis Design School, um, who have a nonprofit teaching fine art to young kids in, in uh, South LA. Another, of course, is Miss Janine Watkins, who's our homeowner, or who's the homeowner. And as I said before, I had a lot to do with the ideas of, con of uh, community symmetry. Um, we have Imani Bias, who is a health and wellness guru. We have Robert Clark, who's a design consultant, and, um, an architectural designer, um, as well as I, I wanted them to pay. I'm not taking any money for this project at all, but I want the team to be able to eat. These are all, this is a black team of collaborators. Um, we have uh, black contractors and, and MEP engineers, and we're trying to um, raise the money to be able to to build this thing at Watts and to give to Watts um, what they deserve, um, or at least a piece of what they deserve. Start with with this house. So, yeah, I know with COVID everything is extremely tough in terms of money. So I understand if people cannot donate. Um, if you could share it, I would definitely appreciate that just as well. Um, and yeah, that that's really the the fundraiser is truly. To, uh, to get that project built. Any other questions? Or Damar, anything else you'd like to discuss? No, I don't think so. Uh, I appreciate everyone uh, being here and taking the time to ask engaging with me uh, and for the kind of words. So yeah, thank you. Thank you, Damar. It was a great evening. We really appreciate your time, your creativity, your enthusiasm, and, and your purpose. Do well. Thanks, Damar. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. All right, so as I mentioned earlier, although uh, Mary Lee has been tracking everybody, uh, you're probably getting used to it now. So for learning units, it's medgar at aiaoc.org. Um, you know, M-E-D-G-A-R at aiaoc.org. If you could please email her with your member number, that would be a big help. She'll get a process, but again, she's been monitoring this throughout the whole presentation. Um, this recording will be on our EDI committee uh, page at AIAOrangeCounty.org, which also links to our YouTube page, AIA Orange County. Uh, and we've already had some requests for it. Thank you, Damar, for allowing us to record this presentation. And I hope we all learned a lot and continue to learn from these issues. Thank you again, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much you. for sharing. It was great. Thanks, Tamar. Thanks, Tamar. Thanks, Tamar. Very good. Sorry I was late, you guys. No, uh, that's okay. Me, but I will be watching the link. Good job, Magna. Thank you. Um, it was good. That was very good. Yeah. And you know, the dialogue was really, I'd say, as great as his presentation, and that mm -hmm. were really engaged and enlightened by what he presented. Yeah. So we'll look at organizing more of these educational programs. Yeah. I like that. Megna, I see you were posting on Instagram. Is there a way you can post something to his fundraiser on there as well? You may have done so already. Um, 
I haven't done it yet because I can't put links on Instagram, but uh, maybe if I make a regular post, I can do that later. Okay. And I'll tag. Sharon could probably help you tomorrow if you want. Okay. That you would know, be good. Up tomorrow. She could help you. Like You could send it to her and then mm -hmm. get it up there if that helps you out. Okay. I'll talk to Sharon tomorrow. Okay. Sounds good. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Good night. Right. Bye. Bye.